all for coming today. Um, hello to everybody online watching. We're so, so, so happy that you could all be here. Um, as most of you know, because you've been bombarded with emails from me um, um, about this, this segment in particular being the first of um, a series, a three series, three part series. I think I sent all of you um, this thing electronically. I do have it in hard copy for any of you who might want it um, while you're here. We're going to be talking today with these amazing folks who have agreed to come out um, um, and be here with you uh, about the next decade in lung cancer, what it looks like, and um, what needs to be done really to, to move the needle forward. I know we talk about it all the time here in this space, um, um, and we're really excited about it. Next month is going to be advocacy. We're going to get a bunch of uh, got a bunch of groups coming together to talk about. Okay, we've heard what the experts have said. Now, what can the advocacy, advocacy groups do together? to move that needle forward. And then in January, it's with all of you to talk about what role patients will play in the next 10 years in order to really, really um, get things moving. So we're really excited about it. Um, it's, everything's a little different, as you guys can see, the, the way it's all set up. Um, as mom said earlier, it looks kind of like church, which is, which is weird. It's not all the, all the couches and stuff laying around. Um, um, and we're going to save the Q&A portion to the end of the meeting. So you guys jot down questions. If you need a, a, a pen and paper, just kind of raise your hand and, and somebody will grab it for you. Um, and then we'll have you guys come to the middle to ask your questions. We sadly don't, don't have enough time to do our around the room um, to let um, these wonderful people know who you are. Uh, but that's kind of what well, we got to do this, this month. Um, do you have anything else you want to add before I introduce Dr. Heifetz? No, or? welcome, and I hope you had fun last night for everybody that was there. Yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. It's quite a night. That was amazing. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Larry Heifetz. Dr. Heifetz came down from Truckee. He is the medical director at the Gene Upshaw Memorial Tahoe Cancer Center. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh, what we want to do today is educate and interact with you guys about what's happening now, what's going to happen in the near future, and how that might affect you. And we appreciate that most of you are singularly focused on your own personal situations. So we'll try to make this as practical as possible. I'd like to introduce my panel, but before we do that, I want to call out the, uh, the donors and special representatives from industry who are here. And I'm going to be, it's a very long list, I'm, I'll do it as, I hope I don't trip over too many words. Bristol Myers Squibb, Boinger Inkelheim, Covidian, Covidian, Myriad, Lilly, Genentech, the Safeway Foundation, Celgene, Biodesic, and Dr. Deborah Morissini, who's the, v, I think, VP of Medical Affairs at Foundation Medicine. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> Clinical development. We're all trying to hustle. Oh, what was the last, what was the real title? So, to my immediate left is Dr. Harvey Pass, who is Professor of Thoracic Oncology and Vice Chair of Research and the Chief of Thoracic Surgery at New York University. He's the editor of Lung Cancer, Principles and Practice, and the associate editor, editor of the Journal of Thoracic Oncology. He's got a special interest in biomarkers, advanced diagnostics, and prognostic indicators, as well as a very sophisticated tissue banking lab for lung cancer and mesothelioma. To his left is Dr. Andrew Allen, MBM, BCH, MA, MRCP, and PhD. He's got a lot of English letters. <laughs> He is chief medical officer and co-founder of Clovis Oncology. It's a publicly traded cancer therapeutics bio biotech company. And they have two current clinical stage programs. One is a PARP inhibitor for ovarian cancer, and the other is a mutant-specific EGFR inhibitor with activity against the T790M resistance mutation. They are starting large-scale phase two to three trials in 2013 and they're developing a companion diagnostic alongside the drug to enable patient selection. And he's also, their company is also working on liquid biopsies, that's blood, as an alternative to needle biopsies for both tumor characterization and long longitudinal studies. To his left is Dr. Itta Laird Ofringa, say it right? <laughs> PhD. And she's the Associate Professor of Surgery and of Biochemistry and of Molecular Biology at, U at USC. She's also the Director of the Program in Biomedical and Biological Sciences. They're working on the identification of cancer-specific 
changes in antibodies and in DNA methyla methylation, a reversible alteration of DNA that can affect gene expression. And this information is used for biomarker development and to gain insight into the sequential molecular steps that happen during the development of lung cancer. Lastly, the guy without the tie, <laughs> is David Jablons, who's professor and chief of thoracic surgery at UCSF. He, he's also the Ada Distinguished Professor of Thoracic Oncology at, UCS, at the UCSF Helen Diller Comprehensive Cancer Center. And usually when someone has one of those named professorships, what that means is they can't fire them. <laughs> and he tries. <laughs> <laughs> he helped start the China, what? Yeah, he helped start the China Clinical Trials Consortium. He co-founded co the Bonnie J. Oderio Lung Cancer Foundation and the Oderio Lung Cancer Medical Institute, where they're developing molecularly, tar molecularly targeted therapies for lung cancer. He's got specific research into the WNT and hedgehog pathways, plus stem cell signaling targets, and he's also developed a thoracic oncology tissue bank. This is a pretty cool group, guys. <laughs> so I'd like to get started and we're going to break this up into a couple of sections, but the first section is how do you make the diagnosis today and how should we make it in the future? So could, could someone, who would like to talk about the difference between a screening test and a diagnostic test? What does that mean, Harvey? So the low-hanging fruit for people who want to do diagnosis in lung cancer is to figure out what the heck is a nodule. I mean, if you've got a nodule on a CAT scan or a chest X-ray, you don't know what it is. So I look at that as a diagnostic test, something that will specifically tell you without invading the patient that that thing has to be worked up because you're worried about a malignancy as opposed to something that's not a malignancy. Screening is proactive secondary prevention. What you're trying to do is you're trying to take individuals who are high risk for something uh, high risk for lung cancer, and you're trying to do some sort of intervention that alerts a physician that that person who's high risk is not any longer high risk, but has something that has to be worked up, and you follow them sequentially. And right now, our best agent for that, of course, is CT scanning where it's been shown that you have a 20% decrease in death from lung cancer if you're able to do a proper screening test. So screening and diagnosis are very different. And when you look for things to tell you, whether it's a screening test or a diagnostic test, they may be completely different tests. So David, what's the risk benefit of a CAT scan of the chest? Um. Well, you know, if done appropriately, the amount of radiation is quite minimal. And, and it's important to remember that the, you know, that technology is moving at warp speed as well. Everything is changing, right, in this business. So the old-fashioned thought that if you do a CT scan and you get contrast and, and what was a CT scan and the dose of radiation you got a decade ago is night and day from what it is today. So presuming your radiation, your radiologists are paying attention, you know, and that's a presumption, but usually they are, then the dose for a non-contrast CT is minimal. It's like flying to Denver, Menver, whatever. So um, where the next World Lung meeting will be, by the way. So the, the, in my mind, it's low. But you know, what Harvey's alluding to, and I think what's interesting is, and, and this is the future, right? The future today. It won't just be screen people over 55 with a 30-pack year history. It'll be much more sophisticated selection based on your genetics, based on, you know, not to give a shameless plug, 23andMe or whatever, or some biomarker in your blood or some sputum analysis or buccal mucosa. You know, we'll know much better who to hone in on so that the, the, the risk of just the simple radiation would be minimal. But, okay, so that's not really the whole answer or the whole question. The other part of that question is don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, so do you really want to get a high resolution image of your chest and upper abdomen because if you're not ready to deal with the consequences of that, then maybe you shouldn't do it in the first place. And that's the whole, you know, the 10 years of, you know, blocking that's happened from small cancer centers in New York that have uh, finally been disproven, you know, of screening in the first place, right? And the answer would be then you find something and you don't know what this nodule is and intervention and risks and, and, and lead time bias, not real benefit. Well, we know now it's not just lead time bias. You know, save lives, as Harvey said, 20% reduction in mortality, fatality, 
by appropriately screened populations. But it's still an issue that once you, you know, poke the skunk and you roll the dice, whatever metaphor you want, you know, and you get an image, what are you going to do with it? Because you can't just ignore it, right? Then you got to either re-image people or you got to biopsy them or you got to, you got to do the next step. So that is where more than a radiation dose, truthfully, I think the issues resolve. Because I think this first phase, it only took 12, 15 years, where Claudia, maybe 20 years, you know, because she started it. Um, it, it. We're finally past that, where people acknowledge that, yes, just like mammography for breast cancer, which, keep in mind, never had a prospective randomized trial proving its benefit, but was overnight adopted. So we're, we're screening, CT screening, low dose, minimal radiation dose, contrast, non-contrast CT screening for lung cancer is accepted now as being beneficial. But it's a whole nother ballgame as to what do you do about the protocols once you do a scan. You know, how often do you follow them? What do you do when you see a nodule? Because 60% of the time you'll find something. You know, so well, on those things. nodules in the high-risk patients, that are biopsied and they turn out to be negative, how many of those in the, in the clinical studies, how many of them had bad outcomes from the biopsies? Very few. Exactly. Right. Right. But I'm, and, and you know that. We know that. And you don't know, know this. And you then tell 10 people, no, but whatever. But I'm just saying that's not the common consensus, you know, because the naysayers will say, oh, well, you know, it's unnecessary, this and that, and complications. It's not really the case versus people who go undiagnosed and get advanced disease and you can't fix them. So there's a pendulum swinging against this. The uh, PSA screening is being pushed away. Colonoscopies are asked to be done less frequently. And, mamma and there's a debate about getting mammograms at, 40 at, at 50 instead of 40. Yeah. There's a lot, and what's driving that are the costs. It's really driven by the costs, not the, not the physical cost of the patient, but the economic wallet costs to society. So. If we roll out the screening for lung cancer to all high-risk patients, how much does that save society? Anybody take a wild guess on that? So it depends upon what you, des what you define as save. I mean, there are standards, standards that we talk about, lives, years saved, and how the, what the cost of that is. And it's believed that if you have a test that uh, the, the standard is if it's less than $10,000 uh, as far as lives you're saved, then it's good. If you look at um, the recent studies that have been done with lung cancer screening that are estimates, um, they really don't fall into that. So I don't know how you answer the question at this point without having a lot more data to say what's going to happen. Although what we do know is the following. It takes a lot more cost to take care of patients who are in the later stages of lung cancer than patients who are found with early lung cancer. And that has been proven time and time again, looking at insurance records as well as looking at the whole state of New York, uh, which proves that. So if, if if you really want to try and shift an economic burden, it's got to be a combination of things. Yes, you're going to save lives. Yes, you're going to have patients who don't have to go on expensive therapies because they have a later stage. But the cost of the CTs, the cost of the individual reading the CT, the cost of doing multiple CTs to see whether things change, that's what we're talking about. So you have to have something before CT that's going to sell you a reason why to get a CT. It's that first filter. And as Ida can tell you, it's not going to be just a demography of the patients, that they're female or that they smoked a certain amount. It's got to be more quantifiable. And that's what labs are working on at this point, something that doesn't hurt the patient, that's very accurate, that has a very high sensitivity and specificity, that will say that that patient needs to move on to a CT scan. You just teed up my next question. It was perfect. Ida, well, could you tell us what thing, that means? The thing we haven't talked about is risk assessment. Okay. So you have diagnosis, before that you have screening, and before that you have risk assessment. And we're talking about screening high-risk groups, but who's a high-risk group, right? And in those non-smoking and young people who, who developed cancers, you know, why are they high-risk? And, and we need to find out who they are. 
And that's where genetics comes in and studying, you know, the young lung cancer patient study to find out why these persons got lung cancer in the first place, what's molecularly going on. And those are very important studies to really identify who we should be screening. And once we know who to screen, then the cost isn't that high because you're not screening a lot of people who don't have cancer. So let's just daydream about taking a blood test. Uh, Larry, and, can I, can yeah, I go ahead, daydream. No, I would just say, because your point that you, you introduce here is critical. You know, we live in a different world. This is not the, the US of A, the great generation US of A, when money was no object then we could do anything and research was you know, unlimited spending. It's just a different world. And so we have to be cognizant of the research dollars. And you work hard to raise the money and you guys go out and beat on people and contribute and we all do that. And sadly, truthfully, this is the way it's gonna move forward, right? It is not gonna be the NIH. But my point is blanket screening in the old days, as we're alluding to and Ida and Harvey have talked about, uh, will not cut it financially, mm -hmm. even though it saves lives. People don't care. They don't have the money anymore. And even, you know, even mammography is probably the wrong answer. In Talk to Laura, it would save billions of dollars to do every other year screening. And in breast cancer, which is not lung cancer, which is not colon cancer, right? I mean, so it's not so um, simple. You know, in broad strokes it is, but in reality, lung cancer is a different beast. It's a more aggressive kind of tumor. Mm -hmm. Breast cancer, probably mammography every year, finds the wrong tumors. You do find tumors that are indolent. Even we, with screening, do BACs and ground glass opacities and you know, all that misery and hate and discontent of tumors that aren't gonna get, get, you know, take you out and don't need to be found necessarily 10 years ahead of time. But so we have to be more sophisticated is all I'm gonna say and change the dogma because, and change the paradigm. And the only way to do that is through better science. Right, and more sophisticated, and like you're alluding to, you know, what's the next out of the box way of thinking? Exactly, right. and I think that's what you're working on, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we're all working on yeah, it. Everybody's working on those. On the, the risk aspects. Yeah. Well, and, but making the diagnosis, screening with a blood test instead of screening with an x ray. Well, I think it's actually very easy in this country because if Eric Snowden is correct, you don't know, need to worry about it. Just ask the NSA. They know when you're going to get cancer. <laughs> They've already, I don't, I, so I don't get colonoscopy because I figure they would tell me if I had a polyp or a problem, you know? <laughs> I mean, welcome to America, baby. <laughs> Andrew, tell me what you guys are doing over at, your, uh, at the lab. Clovis, in terms of this conversation on screening liquid biopsies. We're not involved in, in screening, and, and one of the reasons that most biotech and pharmaceutical companies are not involved in screening is that it's just economically too challenging. Got it. It's hard to kind of create a, an experiment that is going to be likely to lead to a product uh, inside a 20-year time horizon. I mean, if you think about PSA, it, that's the one screening test that is routinely used uh, and as you said, even that is now under increasing pressure in terms of its utility. Because it's really a terrible test. It's a terrible test. They're all terrible tests. It's a tests. terrible test. They're all terrible right. tests, right? They're all, they all have huge problems with sensitivity right. and specificity, which are the things you care about. There's a massive overdiagnosis problem. Um, they're terrible tests. And it's hard to kind of believe that the next test won't equally be terrible, which is not to say we shouldn't do the research to try and get there. That's right. But from a straightforward, um, practical kind of business perspective, it's pretty hard to conjure up that, uh, that belief at this point. And that's why, as a kind of uh, network, I think the world needs kind of all of us to kind of crack this together, because we each have a part to play. We as companies won't be playing at this stage. But of course, once we start to see some light, then things change. Harvey. So I'd like to expand on what Alan just said. I mean, finding biomarkers or finding these risk factors to try and save money is not like baking a cake. There is no formula. And there's a number of things that makes it extremely difficult. First of all, if you want, let's say you want to screen and find something in the blood that says, this patient coming off the street, this blood test says, he is or she is unlike the other patients. You need to do something. You need to get a CAT scan. What is the preparation to do a test like that? Well, first of all, you have to figure out, okay, you have patients that have lung cancer that you can look at their blood. What are you comparing that with? Well, you're comparing it with people who don't have lung cancer, patients who have about the same smoking history, patients who may be about the same proportion of males and females, patients 
who have never been treated for another malignancy. And then comes the confounding issue that people present off the street and get a CAT scan and they got a whole bunch of nodules that you don't know what they are, and they may not be cancer, but that's because they were smokers at one point, or they worked in a certain industry. So what's the control groups that you can say, these people have this profile, while these people who have lung cancer have a different profile? How do you do that in a given amount of time? How much money does it take to get all that blood on those different people to be able to compare it? What platform are you going to use that's going to be able to tell you that? And believe me, there are a whole bunch of platforms, platforms meaning do you use DNA, do you use RNA, do you use protein? I mean, there are so many convolutions of this that in the academic side of life, it's very difficult for somebody in an academic place to run into this and say, I'm going to discover these biomarkers. And that's why, whether you like it or not, you, you actually have to collaborate either with other academics or you have to collaborate with industry. And most importantly, you have to find where are those stored bloods that you can do these analyses in a way that they are robust and you bet your life on them. Because if we discover it, we're going to be betting your life on it. So we have to bet our life on it before it happens. And that's what makes it very difficult. Yeah, and the successful examples, I think, where we're starting to see some uh, potential progress are where countries collect specimens routinely from populations. And obviously that's happened in Europe to a fair extent, Scandinavia being one of the best examples. It's not a coincidence that a lot of the original PSA work came out of Sweden because they have a national health system. Samples were collected routinely from everybody at a particular time point. 10, 15, 20 years later when people then present with a malignancy, you can go back and look at that plasma from 10 years prior and ask some questions about what could, what could we see there that might have predicted. Uh, so that was incredibly helpful for prostate cancer specifically. The UK government's just begun something similar. I'm an American citizen despite the accent, so I have no <laughs> axe to grind here. I'm not beating the drum for the uh, government, but uh, they've just begun a, a plan of collecting uh, genetic material, genomic DNA, from a very broad slice of the population. Again, it's a long-term, longitudinal, 20, 30, 40 year study. What do we find in people somewhere down the road? And then we can go back and start to ask some of those basic questions that Harvey was alluding to. And these are tough studies because the, the challenge with having all of this data is that you will find stuff when you go back and look, and most of it will be irrelevant. It'll just be statistical chance. And so it's difficult. And the more groups you have working on the same problem with different sample sets, when this one finds you know, analyte B seems to predict cancer, and this group says, you know what? We found A and Z and Y, but actually we also found B. Then you start to believe it when you've got these independent data sets showing the same thing. So again, the more we do this collectively, and it's obviously one of the things the foundation and institute are doing so well in terms of leading sample collection and, and warehousing, but the more we do this, the more we'll be able to come up with some answers. So how long can you keep tissue frozen? Indefinitely, I would think. Indefinitely. Right, Liquid as well it, as if you freeze it tumors well. or blood? That man sitting right over there <laughs> was my fellow at the National Cancer Institute. He's the reason. Blame him. <laughs> in he was the inspiration. 1985 to 1987 or so. My specimen collection I use from operations that I scrubbed with DJ that has come with me from <coughs> Bethesda to Detroit to New York. So you must keep it, uh, uh, you have to keep stock of how many times you've unfroze it and that sort of stuff. But you keep it at minus 80 and you watch over it like a hawk and those become very, very good specimens. So indefinitely, if you keep them cer uh, certainly uh, frozen. And I, th I think that's something that we haven't mentioned, but that's why it's so important for all the patients to sign up for trials or if you're being requested to give a specimen of your tumor or your blood, 
it's like gold because you can make discoveries with these materials and none of us would be anywhere without the patient specimens. So, so in the United States, the patients have to be informed about allowing their blood or tissue to be banked for future study. How about in Finland or Norway, which, whichever those Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Sweden was off by had a 25% chance. Country. Right. Cold off, right? Right. Um, you, you still have to give consent. Um, so that stuff from all those years, the page, all those patients with the PSA had informed there will be, consent? Sometimes it'll be consent the other way around, as in the, it's assumed consent would be the phrase, meaning unless you say no, then it will be taken. It varies country to country, obviously. I really think we're getting into the dollars issue again. I mean, it would be great to be able to have every institution that wants to do this uniformly, anybody who comes in to be able to say, give you a consent, would you mind letting us draw your blood, you're gonna have some CBCs done or a chemistry done today, could we please also bank some of your blood? Okay, and I guarantee you there's gonna be 85 to 88% of patients who are gonna say absolutely I'll do that. Mm -hmm. There's only one problem, that one tube of blood or that second tube of blood, somebody has to be paid to stick, put that needle in your arm. Somebody <coughs> has to be paid to take that tube of blood and then spin it down. Somebody has to be paid to then pipette the different components of that blood into little nunk vials to be able to be put into, oh, by the way, you had to buy the minus 80 to be able to store all these specimens. So big academic centers, a lot of them just can't afford to do something like that. And that's where it funnels down to also. If you get a grant for this or you have terrific philanthropy like the lung cancer community really is, then individual places can have the money to make the zippy bags to be able to do this like, like David has and like Ida has. But it's just not a, it's not a uniform phenomenon in the United States. And therefore, you have pockets of places that have these specimens. Let's Let's take, let me ask you a question, just to be a little bit of a pain in the ass here. So how many specimens is enough, right? So that's one thing. And then what happened with uh, that pesky little, you know, once in a hundred year uh, rainstorm you guys had in New York a year ago? You know, wh <coughs> what happens with those carefully guarded samples when the power is out in lower Manhattan? So and, and what do you do with your samples? So David is alluding to the fact, how many specimens are enough? So my, I'm very fortunate. I mean, as much as we diss the government, the government pays me money because I have a grant to be able to do this cause, so that we can discover things in lung cancer as well as in mesothelioma. And so I have a system set up where I do this. So I'm able to look at components of blood, plasma and serum, the cellular components of blood, the white blood cells and the non-white blood cells. I'm able to look at uh, the tissue itself, the lung, lung cancer tissue, as well as the normal lung when I operate on a patient, but I get permission for that, okay? So that's all stored away on patients that are operated on at NYU, so we can use that. In October of last year, we had a storm that completely knocked out all of the power uh, at NYU and at Bellevue. And Bellevue is our sister hospital that we cover, That's the, that is where my lab is on the 15th floor. All of my five minus 80 freezers that had over 30 years of work in it were on emergency power, but there's only one problem. All of the pumps that pump the diesel fuel up to the emergency power were flooded, and the only way to keep the emergency power alive was the National Guard came in and in nine flights of stairs had a bucket, big, big bucket brigade of diesel fuel coming up to fuel the auxiliary power to keep my specimens from melting. So we had no elevators. I could not get my, because the power is out, I could not get my specimens out. And also there were two patients that were on auxiliary power that couldn't get out of the hospital. But what happened is that when those two patients, when the one freight elevator worked and they got those patients out, the city said, we're shutting down. So, and the National Guard's going home. So a quick phone call to Indianapolis where they had a cryo storage place that I've used before, 
big 18-wheeler came, took all the specimens to Indianapolis, and saved all of my specimens while a lot of people lost everything. But that's, that's how fragile this whole situation is. And I was down. I couldn't do any research for five months. So even an, an act of God can take all of this away. And that's why you have to have redundancy Correct. and send sp se specimens to right. other people so that in case of an emergency, you're not going to lose everything. But with respect to how many is enough, I think, I think he answered it. The countries that have these national health plans have an enormous riches of resources to answer questions. I, I, I would say you never have enough specimens. Yeah, well, I would Except say. Except that cost is an issue. Yeah. But in countries with national yeah. health plans, where they, Finland, Norway, where they can do great studies because they have all these specimens on people, that's, that's enormously powerful. And I think that's true for looking at incidents and screening. But honestly, we're here about you know fixing the problem, right? right? And uh, and I think, you know, uh, what's the right analogy here? It, it, the government has spent a lot of money. It's been a minimal, you know, impact. Although it's finally, finally, 50 years of investment in the National Cancer Institute coming around to actually change someone's outcome who has locally advanced disease of any cancer of any kind. But I think we have to, you know, challenge the dogma a little bit. We have to think out of the box a little bit more. So, firstly. Just let's raise our hand. And Harvey, that's an amazing story, because I've, I've always wondered how you saved the day. And I knew you would save the day, because you, like Bonnie, will not be uh, ignored by minor you know, hurricanes and typhoons. But, but who thinks this is ridiculous? Because firstly, you know, Hurricane you know, Frank or whatever is coming in another year to New York and wherever else. You know, those, the, let's just get our head out of the sand. Or the but, earthquake in California. Yeah, no, exactly right. And the same is true with ours. So this is why you know, we started melting our tissue down, bank down. Because uh, you know, we live in a modern era, right? And so what I'm saying is we have to get out of our silos. And this is apropos of the how many are enough. So you know, I agree with you for screening. You know, Sweden, Iceland probably is where most of those incident studies happen. This is why I would never drive a Volvo. But anyway, um, you know, because it gives you cancer, I think, and goes so slow. But um, the point is we have to change the approach, right? I think we have enough for some of the therapeutics from the diagnostic targets we need to validate between the five or six or 100 people here, there, and everywhere who has it. I think we should just go to um, Japan. What's the incidence? It's a westernized country, right? I mean, they're slightly different genetics, but not that different. Um, and it's a quirky little island, for sure. But nonetheless, the fact of the matter is, what's the incidence of uh, stage one lung cancer in Japan? Is it like 10 to 15% like we see here? Harvey, half the time, what do we see? We're operating on people who have you know, tumors invading their mediastinum and everything else. It's insane. <coughs> but in, in Japan, 55% are stage one cancers. And that's been going on for 15 years now. Why is that? They were pretty They've been screening. screening them for longer. Or, or they eat a lot of sushi. I don't know. No. Um, no. It's screening. They've been doing screening. They mandated the law a decade ago saying if you're over 50 and you smoke, which means you have a pulse and you're a male, 85% of people smoke, guess what? Very good. Here's your paycheck and your Christmas or whatever bonus. Get in the scanner. Oh, well, I can't get there. Well, yes, you can because it's right outside your work. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, there it is. There's a van. The truck is out there. So they mandatory screening, period. And, and guess what? 55% lung cancer is stage one. So I don't know how many samples they banked, or if any. Maybe they had a policy. Maybe they didn't. Maybe we could go and find out what's going on with that, not reinvent the wheel here, and figure out who needs to be screened, what are the incidents. Granted, there are a lot of you know, nationality, perhaps gender specific, or not gender, but um, you know, country specific things. But we've shown that China, lung cancer in China is very similar to lung cancer in the United States. It's lung cancer is lung cancer. Anyway, Tony, what were you in? What business were you in before? Technology. You became in the lung cancer. Thank you very much. Technology. So now, you know, apropos, this is about the future, right? right. Isn't that why Absolutely. I'm not selling cheese right now? Because That's I right. wanted to bring the future to you. <laughs> exactly. I think we need to say, forget this. This is the past. We have to just go. You know, if Google knows what you're hovering over, you can't tell me we can't think of a better way to figure out lung cancer in real time. Okay? So where is lung cancer? Where is breast cancer? Where are any of these cancers going to be cured? I've been saying this for a decade now, and it's true. Probably at NYU, right? Okay, and maybe USC, whatever. But if not there, from our, our geographic vantage point, it's going to be right here in Redwood City. Little did I know that you would start the Adario thing right here. But <laughs> how ironic and perfect. It's going to be right here because cancer is going to be cured somewhere between the biotechnology of the Bay Area and the high technology of Silicon Valley, right? And that's right here it's in Redwood right City. 
That is the future. So big data. Maybe you don't need half of these samples anymore. You know, maybe you can see the trend analysis. Maybe you can bring the clouds that are the friendly clouds, not the rain clouds, whatever, you know, and make this thing work. But that is where people have to start. And people are already doing this, of course. You know, this is not you know, rocket science. This is just common sense. So David just actually gave a perfect wrap to the first part of this, which is about screening and diagnostics. Made a perfect circle about the whole thing, and it was really helpful. Let's talk about what happens once you've got the diagnosis. There's a thing called a tumor board, and a tumor board is a multidisciplinary meeting, which is a closed door meeting. And multidisciplinary means you've got pathologists, uh, maybe a primary care physicians, you've got on medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, you've got thoracic surgeons. Uh, who did I forget? I, Pulmonolo pulmonologists and source, uh, associated other characters from medical staff. Closed doors, patients aren't allowed to be in there, and the gloves are off in a friendly, safe room. And they were invented about 50 years ago, they invented after the Second World War, to answer the question, what do, I do, what do I do now? And they've become standard for all major hospitals. For all hospitals, we try to have these tumor boards. So what's the basic... Uh, once we know what the stage of the patient is, and, and I don't think we need to go through too much in terms of staging, but stage one means you have a little, and stage four means you have a lot, and stage two and three is in between, and it's a function of where, uh, what the probability of a good outcome is, and then it defines, it, it informs what our treatment choices are. So the standard treatment choices are surgery, and then we have three things, surgery, radiation therapy, and drugs. Drugs are called chemotherapy, which is a really bad word, but medical therapy, <laughs> pharmaceutical therapy, which is broken down to a zillion different ways. Uh, Harvey, could you describe the difference for the group between primary definitive therapy adjuvant therapy and neoadjuvant therapy and what that's all about. We're going to get into targeted stuff in about a millisecond, but just at the beginning, what, how do we figure out what to do with a patient at the beginning? You want to figure out, first of all, whether this thing is localized or whether it's not localized. If it's localized, then you want a local regional therapy that's going to take and go abracadabra, it's gone. And the best way to do that right now is with surgery. Now, sometimes you're wrong with regard to whether you think that this was just in the lung. And if you find that this has gone to lymph glands either within the lung or outside the lung, then it's been shown that you can do an adjuvant therapy besides the surgery. Adjuvant therapy, adding something postoperatively. And the good news on that also is that there's studies now that show that actually you can make patients live longer if you add certain therapies after you operate on them. So sometimes, though, you, are, you have a patient who presents with a tumor that is defined as not just local regional, but already has gone to the lymph nodes before you even operate on the patient. And that's done by staging and invasive staging. So you find that the lymph nodes are involved. Well, in that case, we found that it's best to treat those patients with therapy before you operate, and then think if the patient has an operative situation after you have given the preoperative therapy, and that's induction or neoadjuvant therapy. The most controversial is the induction of the neoadjuvant therapy, where there's always arguments about what is the role of surgery with that, which I won't get into. But depending upon the stage of the patient, which is probably a critical point in taking care of lung cancer, that can define which of these three you're going to go to. Early surgery, surgery a little bit more adjuvant, something that you are worried about that surgery won't take care of, induction. David, did you want to? No, I, I, that's, that's it in a nutshell. But also, uh, excuse me, how many of you people have uh, dead Steve Jobs technology on you? Anybody? Do you have a smartphone? 
Yeah. Okay, so why is the most important worst word you ever heard? This is a small, not so, wait, double negative, not so small, dark blue cell. What did you say, doctor? Excuse me. And you went to college? It's a double negative. Your mother told you that's wrong. Non-small cell lung cancer? It's a dark blue cell disease. It's two centimeters. It's involving one node. It's not. It's a, I mean, you know, 16th century technology. And yet, let me look at the speed of light at the internet and find out what the therapies are. It's a joke, right? So the, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in the stars, but in our genes, plasma, protein, methylated promoters, whatever you like. But I'm saying is we need to be more sophisticated. We have the technology, molecular studies for advanced stage, for early stage, not a two centimeter T1 N0 based on what? Histology? By, uh, if, do you look at all the nodes? Did you sample all the nodes? Did the pathologist cut them all? I mean, it's never going to work, right? So the disease can tell you, inform the innate aggressiveness. And we know that. I mean, so it's David's into the future is now, which goes on <laughs> yeah. to the future stuff, right. which is correct because Why not? he's one of the few that's been able to show that you can take actually just the genes from the tumor and say which ones in early stage there's going to be good actors that are stage one and bad actors that are stage one. <coughs> and they're not all treated the same. Well, actually they are. And you shouldn't treat them all the same. Somebody, so maybe there's not an indication for chemo for some of those bad actors, but you know that they're going to be bad actors, so maybe we ought to change that. So, so that's here and getting further validated, and there may be other things. But in other words, what we're saying is the old concepts of what a tumor looks like, how big it is, or how bad it is, are going to be reduced to potentially these type of genomic studies, these type of studies that actually tell us what the tumor is actually like. When we went to medical school, which was a zillion years ago, we had to take this test and do these tests. We would go from microscope to microscope, and you would look at, look at slides, and it was called pattern. It's nothing more than pattern recognition. Oh, that's a couple of slides, and that looks like it could make, be making glands, so that's going to be called an adenocarcinoma. And this looks kind of weird, and that's going to be called a sarcoma. These are just studies, uh, words that were created by these great German scientists in, uh, in 1880. And we've been stuck with this kind of care, uh, classification system. So what they're talking about is that is really going away into a new world of, of uh, labeling and, and identification of what these cells really are with words that old guys who went to med school a long time ago have a real hard time keeping up with. So think, could you explain it's, some it's, of the new world to I us? Think it's I think it's helpful to explain a little bit what it's all about. Please. So looking at a cell as a pathologist does, which is really important, but you're, it's like looking at the book, the cover of a book. There's so much information in there, so much molecular information. A lot of the information is the genes, and every cell has three times 10 to the ninth, three billion nucleotides. Mm -hmm. And there's so much information in there, and the reason we're making so much progress is because we now have technology that allows these genes to be sequenced really relatively quickly, and that technology is speeding up exponentially all the time and becoming cheaper. So what that's allowing doctors and scientists to do is to look at the molecular changes inside of the cancer cell, and they're not only changes in the genes, but also in how the genes are wrapped up whether the cell can actually access the information in certain genes or not. So there's a lot of molecular information, and that molecular information is going to be different in different um, samples from people. So I still believe that we need a lot of those samples. It's just um, pretty expensive to analyze the whole genome of, of a cancer cell. But ultimately, as these techniques progress, we'll be able to get at this molecular information, all the different types of molecular information, and study it as uh, they do in David's lab to see, you know, we have 100 patients, and some of them uh, did really well, and then others didn't. And what were the molecular differences between them? So how do you figure out which mutation means something. How do you actually, do, if you have a zillion you choices, a, how do you winnow it down? That's the bioinformatic challenge. That's, that's why the Silicon challenge. Valley people come in. Right, big data can help, you know. Um, but first you have to have the tissues, you have to have the technology to analyze them high throughput and cost effectively. Well, those technologies are actually pretty much here. And you know, you, you, you can do what used to be an entire building back in the aught six when I trained with Harvey. And he looks still so young and gorgeous. <laughs> but anyway, an entire what could be done 
an entire, took a whole building, Bob Gallo, you know, building 39 or whatever it was, okay? Now you can do it in the a desktop, you know, sequencer like this. A whole building, I mean, that's 30 years. But the important thing also is, again, you, you, you need to have the tissue, yes, and you need to have the technology to be able to figure out and order and rank the genes as to which are important. But if you want to do a test like David does, you have to have the outcomes of those patients. You have to know how they did so that you have, app that, again, data that you would bet your life on. You, you, need, you need to have called the patient or you need to know what the status of that patient is at this point. You can't guess because you're defining something by a gene profile that you want to be accurate. So you can't assume the patient is alive just because you can't find him. So that takes a lot of time too. So the extraordinary workload to be able to do that, not just to interpret 29,000 genes on a gene array and to figure out which ones are important together, but also the data has to be pristine. And because you've got to validate that with another group to make sure that that profile is the, works in this other group that has the same sort of long-term survival. So it has to be independent and blinded validation and an algorithm, which would eliminate Myriad, but nonetheless. <laughs> so Andrew, how the hell did you guys find your drug? You've got this mutant-specific EGFR inhibitor. Yeah, so the world of biotech and pharma typically operates at the other end of the spectrum from the kinds of presentations we've been talking about. So as you all know, uh, some patients present early and some unfortunately present late, or some present early and end up progressing and end up being in the later stages when the tumor is so invasive that you can't cut it out, um, you can't realistically hope to, to shrink it all the way uh, with radiation, uh, and they perhaps patients will have a metastasis already or multiple metastases. So now you're into the realm of systemic therapy. And that's where companies tend to operate because it's a, it's a much faster and simpler environment in which to try and see whether your new drug actually works or not. As you can imagine from the conversations we've had, if you take your new drug straight into a neoadjuvant or an adjuvant setting, these trials will take years because many patients actually never needed the drug and they're going to do just great anyway. And it takes a long time to work out whether your drug is adding anything. So it's much uh, more efficient to, to start your drug discovery and your drug development in the later stages of disease. So there's this well-described uh, condition now, mutant EGFR lung cancer, that many of you are familiar with. Uh, and it was the first step from taking this kind of primitive Victorian uh, stamp collecting approach to pathology mm -hmm. and saying, you know, you have lung cancer and because we're specialists, we can call it non-small cell or small cell. Uh, and then the treatments are all identical after that initial split. Mutant EGFR lung cancer was the first in the lung cancer context to really show that there's actually a completely different path that should be followed based upon the detection of a single mutation. Um, so there's this mutation in a particular gene, the epidermal growth factor receptor gene. It's part of a growth factor system, so it's not an entire surprise, as the name suggests, that when this system goes out of control, then cells grow out of control and cancer forms. And the first drugs that came along, there were two of them, one called Tarsiva from uh, OSI Roche Genentech, depending upon where you live in the world, and another drug called Iressa from AstraZeneca. Uh, and those were inhibitors of uh, EGF receptor. Uh, and initially, actually, they were developed for many different tumors because we didn't appreciate that actually this subset of lung cancer had mutations. And then about a decade or so ago, these mutations were described and it became suddenly and miraculously clear that there were a group of people who were deriving enormous benefit from these specific, very well tolerated single agent therapies. So whereas traditionally they would have received you know, combination therapy with a platinum and a taxane, all of a sudden patients were receiving a pill and deriving very, very meaningful benefit. So that was a huge step forward. Um, there have been many more similar discoveries in lung cancer. And so lung cancer now is one of the, probably the poster child in the solid tumor world for what we used to think of as being a single disease actually is a whole set of different diseases. And we're taking a slightly random walk into the universe of lung cancer by frankly finding stuff and then saying, aha, we found some of these and we'll label them in this way. And we've now kind of segmented lung cancer. So in the world of adenocarcinoma, that commonest type of lung cancers, um, probably around half of them now have a specific 
me molecular mechanism that we have drugs for. So that's been a huge step forward. It's, it's complicated because we've now got lots of different drugs and we kind of think we know that we should be using this drug for this disease, but as soon as a patient progresses, you're kind of back to the old world and you're back to using traditional chemotherapy. And that may not be the right thing to do. And I think, I think David, you were kind of alluding to this, there's gonna to need to be a huge clinical trial effort that's ongoing, it'll never end really, where we start to map all of the therapies we're still using today into this new world of molecular characterization of tumors. We're doing it sort of piecemeal at the minute, but we need to be more systematic about it. Anyway, in the world of EGFR mutations, it became clear that patients did beautifully, on average, for about 10 months on one of these two drugs, Tarceva or Eressa. And then, unfortunately, the disease would come back and patients would, uh, would progress clinically with worsening of symptoms. And through further molecular work, it became clear that one of the, uh, in fact, the most common mechanism for developing the resistance to these drugs was a second mutation in the EGF receptor gene. And this is the now somewhat famous T790M mutation. And it was great that we kind of made that discovery. And then the question, of course, was, well, what, what therapies do we have? Uh, simplistically, this mutation replaces a small um, little knob in, this, in the EGF receptor protein with a big sort of bulky side chain that sticks out and it stops the Eressa and the um, Tarceva molecules from binding just by blocking their access to the active site. So it's just an example of how tumors use Darwinian natural selection to just mutate, keep mutating, and whatever they come up with that's successful will be selected for in that survival of the fittest uh, concept. So this T790M mutation is now fit in a patient receiving Tarceva because the Tarceva can't hit the, uh, the protein anymore and the patient will progress. So we teamed up with uh, a chemistry company uh, to develop a molecule that would hit T790M and some very elegant chemistry, and we're not a chemistry company, so this was the work of, a, of another partner of ours, uh, involved using what's now called covalent chemistry where most drugs kind of float in, float out of their targets, but for those of you with a bit of chemistry history, covalent binding is where a drug actually locks in and forms a solid bond with its target. And the drug that we have developed is a covalent inhibitor, which is a, it used to be a common class of drugs. Then they fell out of favor because they're sometimes associated with allergic reactions. And there's been a renaissance now of interest in these covalent drugs. And the reason for that is that because the drug locks on covalently and binds into place, you can engineer exquisite specificity of the molecule because you just put a little wrinkle on the drug and all of a sudden it won't fit because its conformation is so fixed, whereas with the older drugs, they just float in, float out, there's a lot more wiggle room. So because of the covalent binding, we engineered some spikes. This drug now has great specificity for T790M and uh, hits the traditional activating mutations as well. So it acts like Tarceva and Arrestor in that regard. And obviously the, the, what we hope is the, the final magical touch to the product is that it doesn't seem to inhibit the normal EGF receptor. Um, so I want to get this speaking. straight. The patient has an EGFR uh, mutation, is given an EGFR inhibitor, and then develops the, the T790 mutation, or the cancer shows up with both those mutations So the get-go? That's a very interesting question as to whether the mutation is present at the very beginning of the disease or whether it just comes along during the course of Tarceva therapy. Uh, to cut a long story short, we don't know the answer to that. But what we do know is that it is the re reason for resistance in many patients uh, receiving Tarceva therapy. But, and but not so to give you a billion dollar other indication, which you should get anyway, apropos of the INHERIT study, what percentage of those patients harbor a germline T790 mutation? And you, you must know the answer to that. Yeah, it's small, right? It's, it's, small, one, small. it's one or two percent. Yeah, and so Jeff the patients who develop it, one or two percent. So nothing over baseline. Well. This gets to the issue of diagnostics, right? So many of you are familiar with chronic myeloid leukemia and the miracle drug Gleevec that has been um, so dramatically transformational in that disease and has really turned a fatal leukemia into now uh, one of the commonest forms of leukemia because patients do so very, very well on these targeted therapies. If you think of sort of natural selection, it seems to operate pretty much the same way across multiple tumors. They all have the same fundamental game plan, right? The tumor strategy is essentially the same, which is to be uh, unstable at the level of DNA and uh, epigenetically. 
And the reason that tumours do that is it means that they're constantly evolving. And whatever you throw at them, they will throw up a series of different mutations, most of which will be disastrous. But every so often, one of them will suddenly give the tumour cell success in the face of whatever that selection pressure is. Um, and we've seen that play out very nicely in, in leukaemia, where patients start off on Gleevec. They do great. In, this, in that case, for actually typically for several years. But often they'll get another resistance mutation. And now we've got a whole suite of drugs that can come in and treat those acquired resistance mutations. And so we're just getting smarter. And we've turned that disease into this chronically manageable disease. And obviously our goal in lung cancer, at least with the mutant EGFR, now with the mutant ALK patients, with some of the other rarer mutations, PI3 kinase and so on, the goal is to really do the same thing. Just keep throwing drugs at it, maybe in combination, uh, and just keep the disease suppressed, keep it under control. And the, an the analogy we often draw is with um, viral infections. You know, HIV, when looking around the room, most of us, I think, obviously sort of saw that the emergence of HIV in the 80s when it was just a uniformly lethal disease and huge numbers of young people dying from it. And now it's a completely different concept. That, that's obviously one of our goals in cancer therapy. And I think we have the tools now. We are, we're starting to understand the genetics of our enemy. We're starting to understand the strategy of the tumor cell. The more we can characterize it, the more we can tailor the drugs to treat it. We can do clinical trials of single agents of combinations and start to just change the, the dynamic of the disease. And could you just uh, clarify for the world the difference or the similarity between targeted therapy and immunotherapy, an inhibitor versus a monoclonal antibody. And are we targeting the patient or are we targeting the tumor? Okay, so those are all great questions. I'm going to write them down to make sure I get them. So, tar I mean, personalized what? versus immuno. Yeah, targeted versus immuno. Sorry, targeted immuno. And then a MAB versus a NIB. Yep. Or a Zumab. These words, trastuzumab, bevacizumab, I mean, they're designed by the pharmaceutical industry to be able to come up with really good brand names like Avastin and Herceptin. Well, they do, right? <laughs> kind of deliberately. You want the exactly. generic name to be unmemorable and impossible. Impossible, so Everybody right. uses the brand or name find instead, a right? click ah. That's right. the logic to it. So to go through your list, so targeted versus immuno. So a targeted therapy, the way we typically use it, is to say we found a mutation in a specific gene that leads to a slightly different protein, and we have a drug that's selective for that protein, and therefore it spares everything else. And therefore, in theory, you can take the drug, you get all the benefits of hitting the mutant, therefore hurting the cancer cell, nothing else gets affected. That's the goal. You know, our drugs, we're getting there. We're not perfect yet, but we're getting, we're getting closer. So that's targeted. Immunotherapy is a form of therapy that just typically stimulates your immune system to start to recognize the tumor as, as the enemy. If you think about the way your immune system's evolved, it's all about recognizing non-self infection, typically, right? So a virus, a bacterium, or a fungus comes in, your immune system says, aha, I'm familiar with what I used to see every day on my walk. You know, I'm just taking a walk down Chestnut Street, I, get, I see the same things every day, and all of a sudden, vroomph, there's a zebra, and your immune system recognizes it as foreign, locks onto it, and destroys it. That's what we, we like to have happen, obviously. And tumors are playing a game where they're trying to change so that they can grow, but they're trying to evade your immune system. And again, I use the term try, but of course, this isn't a conscious process. This is all natural selection. But the tumor that's successful, the tumor cell that's successful, can grow and grow and grow, but is invisible to your immune system. And that's obviously the problem. So the question is, all right, so the tumor, system, the tumor cell has clearly changed in some way to enable it to grow uncontrollably. Can I turn on the immune system to recognize whatever that particular secret is and thus identify the tumor as non-self and destroy it? And the first set of therapies uh, that took this path were developed, like Steve Rosenberg is probably the name you have to use, right? Mm -hmm. um, as the guy that started doing this in the 70s with interleukin-2. Um, and that turned into a, a drug product um, that was uh, and still is available for melanoma and for kidney cancer. And it was a difficult drug to use, and we used to give high doses of it, and still do in some cases. And it absolutely turns on the immune system, but in a pretty non-selective way. So your immune system goes into overdrive, and that means it releases all kinds of attack molecules, but in a very indiscriminate manner. So rather than you know, shooting the, uh, the zebra on Chestnut Street with a sniper rifle, you've just launched a sort of massive uh, bomb attack on the street, and there's chaos all around. 
Now, the, the good thing is it wasn't fatal, right? Patients didn't die from the toxicity, but they would have a stormy few weeks in intensive care typically. But if you're one of the lucky three, four percent, your tumors melted away, and it was absolutely miraculous. And I remember I worked at Chiron and was responsible for this drug at one point, going to Steve's office, and there's a series of black and white photographs around his office wall of some terrible haircuts from the 70s and 80s. And uh, these were the first patients that were cured who had metastatic melanoma and renal cell cancer. You know, melanoma is just a horrendous disease, just with obviously just covering the skin off and very disfiguring, and just these miraculous cures. And it's just absolutely inspirational stuff. Actually, those pictures were the fellows. And <laughs> <laughs> bad things have improved. <laughs> um, so, so that was the first. Now, um, we've now, we went through a fallow period where people, you know, in our world, venture capitalists threw tons of money at, at therapies because it was so exciting, these cures. Um, and nothing worked, and vaccines were just disappointing for decade after decade. And things have suddenly turned around in the last couple of years with a new wave of therapies that are targeted at the same concept. They're immunotherapies, they turn on the immune system, but they seem to be both more effective, so more patients are getting benefit than did with uh, interleukin-2, and they're also typically better tolerated, so you don't have two weeks in the intensive care unit. Now, they do have certain toxicities, but um, the, the benefit-risk ratio seems to have shifted pretty dramatically with this new set of antibodies, particularly PD-1 and PDL one I'm sure you've, you've heard about. So that is a very, very exciting uh, advance. They're targeted in the sense that they're against specific molecules, but they're in the immune system, and that's why they tend to get the term immunotherapy. Got it, got it, got it. So that was the first one. The second one will be much briefer, so the, the names. So antibodies are um, biological constructs which reflect they are similar to what's already in your body, uh, the antibodies that our body uses and makes itself to fight infection. And so we, you know, part of the early uh, biotechnology era was learning to, how to make antibodies at an industrial scale that we could then infuse into patients' blood. Um, so they're proteins, they're hard to make, they're complex, uh, they're big. You have to have live cells in a big tank, a fermenter, pumping out these proteins, which you then have to purify. So it's a complex process, but obviously they're incredibly effective forms of therapy now for many diseases, not just cancer. So that's antibodies. And the name will always end in MAB. So that's kind of, there's an international naming nomenclature, the INN, that we have to sort of submit drug names to. Uh, and it's, it's all about, are you following the rules? Are you, you're not allowed to call your drug things like, you know, wonder fix. That's kind of not accepted. You have to kind of play, play a slightly more subtle game than that. And there are certain rules, as I say. So antibodies always end in MAB. And if, uh, if the antibody looks very like a human antibody, then zoo is put in there, zoo MAB, to tell you that it's uh, reflective of a human antibody as opposed to a mouse one, because some of the early antibodies came out of mice. So those are the MABs, and then the IBs are small molecules that inhibit particular enzymes. And they, again, they all have the same suffix of ib. So you'll see uh, imatinib, that's Gleevec. Um, erlotinib is Tosiva. Gefitinib is Irasa, et cetera, et cetera. That was really, honestly, very helpful to me. <laughs> and one more thing on therapy and daydreaming. Can you imagine a situation where stereotactic body radiation could be equivalent in early stage lung cancer to surgery. And my wife that's is a radiation surgery. oncologist. Yes. Long panel. That's uh, full disclosure. <laughs> so if you'd asked me that question about uh, three or four years ago, I would have said, absolutely, we're gonna go out of, we're gonna be put out of business and it's gonna be real difficult. And there's a little known study that will be published of 35 patients through the radiation therapy oncology group. These were patients who came to us and said, we've been told we have a lung cancer that can be taken out, but we don't want it taken out. We want to be treated with stereotactic body radiation therapy. So they, they were perfectly normal. These weren't patients that were compromised that you would give this radiation therapy that is actually just three doses of radiation therapy targeted to the tumor, different planes, so that you give a very high dose and you only give it in three fractions instead of over five weeks. That's stereotactic body radiation therapy. Well, the study 
went very well, but the results show that you have excellent, excellent local control, uh, but it's not superior to surgery. And in fact, there are complications with this, with rib fractures and chest wall pain. And I'm not so sure that it's really going to take all the surgeons away, especially because well-trained surgeons uh, know how to do. <laughs> Trained by the best. Right. Yeah. Well-trained surgeons know how to do operations that they don't have to take a lot of lung these days. And in fact, that's the whole point now of minimally invasive and doing it smaller with smaller holes, with no rib spreading, but also certain tumors, you don't have to take the whole lobe. And we're learning that, and that's going to be validated in studies that are going to come online soon. But these tumors that are not completely solid, we're learning that they have a different biology. And you got to be careful that you may get another one of those that'll come back in four years. And if you've taken a lobe out, then what are you going to do for that one that's coming back in four or five years? So I'm not so sure that stereotactic, but what you have to be aware of is that radiation therapy may have different uses in the future because it's actually been shown now that if you combine radiation therapy in patients who have disease that's outside the chest and you add one of these immune stimulating factors, lo and behold, when you treat one area with the radiation, by God, there are other areas that weren't treated with radiation that because you've enhanced the immune effect, they start shrinking and go away. So the question, so the question is whether you have new agents that stimulate the immune system, and then because you're doing something to the primary tumor or something else, you're releasing something that has memory that stimulates the immune system even more to go and attack that in a more <coughs> specific way. So stay tuned for that. I think that's I, called an abscopal effect. Right. And it's really cool when it happens. Okay, so now how can the patients be sure they're getting the state of the art? Can we, should we, and how could we make the multidisciplinary model of care standard in the United States? Can we talk about the integration between academic centers, private industry, and community oncologists. Because the fact, the fact in the United States is that 15% of the patients are taken care of in the ivory towers, and 85% of the patients are taken care of by community oncologists in community hospitals. So. I'd like to hear Alan answer this, because does Alan is at the forefront, like other industries, with really stuff that we don't, we don't find, uh, new, new drugs or new ways, and how industry maybe needs or doesn't need to be able to interact with all these different people and how, how you do it and how important it is to you. Well, I can give you know, a perspective, right? It's not the whole perspective, but the, the way we see the world. So when we take a drug first into patients, you, you want to be working with really good, phys experienced physicians who are typically in academic centers. In phase one units, there are these days typically dedicated phase one units because you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, at some level, the first day your drug that you've been working on for years goes into a patient is at the same time the most exciting and the most terrifying uh, days that we probably have because you just don't know. And there are cases, unfortunately, where things have gone wrong, that you just, you did your best, you tried to predict what would happen, and you just, there's a difference between humans and dogs and rats. I guess we're all happy to hear that, but it's true. Uh, so you just don't know for sure. Not an actor. I'm not happy to hear that. <laughs> so phase one, we'll go into academic centers, and uh, you'll be starting with a low dose, and then you gradually work your way up. And you know, it's typically done, these days, usually a group of two or three different sites. Sometimes all it's US. Sometimes, for various reasons, you'll work internationally. But the physicians are in constant contact with each other and with us as the sponsor. So you're all learning collectively from every patient that goes into the trial. So that's the phase one. Now, as we then head into phase two and phase three, 
increasingly phase two studies are becoming the, the registrational studies uh, in oncology with targeted therapeutics because you're showing that the, the, the drug on its own in a patient is causing the tumor to shrink away. And tumors typically uh, outside of the very rare melanoma and kidney cancer patient, those tumors don't spontaneously shrink away, unfortunately. So if you give a patient just your drug, nothing else, just your drug and the tumor shrinks, you're confident that that's an effect of the drug. And the FDA in the US will accept uh, trials like that, so-called single arm trials, because there's only one drug being used. And they will accept those for accelerated approval of the drug, assuming you have a good response rate, meaning that you know, north of 30, 40% of patients are responding. And the responses are durable, typically six months or so, uh, at least in length. So that's a phase two study, and you can therefore quickly go from phase one to phase two, and that's one of the exciting things for us and for you, is that you're not sitting back watching a drug that's clearly working have to go through four or five years of phase two and phase three trials before it eventually reaches patients. So advocacy has really helped push, I think, the, the calibration of benefit risk in a direction favorable to, to patients, whereby they're getting access to the drugs a little sooner. Let me interrupt for one second. A response means shrinking something down by 50% of its measurable size, period. That's called a partial response. If you don't get that, you can't call it a partial response. You can't dream about getting a complete response until you get a partial response. So those are pretty locked in measures that we all use. Go ahead. Yep. So when we're in phase two, we're now thinking about registration and moving quickly. And now the question is, well, what patients am I going to be uh, trying to put into this trial and where are those patients found? And that's where, interestingly, academic centers sometimes don't have the patients that you need for your phase two and three trials because, as you said, right, most patients are cared for in the community. So when you're newly diagnosed with lung cancer, often that first round of chemotherapy, assuming that the first treatment is chemotherapy, will be administered in the community. And often our drugs might be used for second line or third line. Those patients are being cared for in the community. And so our, our focus sometimes shifts from the academic centers to the community. And one of the great things uh, in this country right now is that more and more community hospitals are joining networks of clinical trial groups that enable us to do trials in the community, uh, which is great, obviously, for the patients who get access to the drugs and the good care of a clinical trial, and obviously great for us as drug developers, because now we can find the patients and do the trial quickly, which is good for everybody. So there's a pivot. Now, we continue to work with the academics, of course, throughout the whole process, because no sooner have you done your or started your phase two trial than you're immediately thinking, well, what's next? Is there a combination we should be using? And so the academics are a vital part of our enterprise. But just the heavy lifting of putting 200, 300, 400 patients into a trial is more and more being done in the community. Um, it's a very important part of our business. Uh, but the, the cost of that, just talk to the cost of what those okay. trials cost yeah, per the, patient. The costs are brutal. Um, it typically costs us, this is a very crude estimate, but about $100,000 per patient for a trial. So when we're doing a trial of 100 patients, that's 10 million. So 100 that, patients would be the absolute minimum smallest trial you could ever oh, get away yeah, with. Oh, yeah, you pretty much. And people wouldn't even solid buy it. You wouldn't get an approval on, on 100 right. patients. So that's 10 million. So you can see how quickly, as soon as you start getting into big phase three trials where you're randomized and you've got 500 patients getting standard chemotherapy and 500 getting standard chemotherapy plus the new drug, let's say, that's 1,000 patients. It's a $100 million trial. Um, and so we try to obviously do those cautiously and try and de-risk them, but de-risking can be tricky. And the duration, right? I mean, 100,000 uh, patients, 500 each arm, how long does it take, even it's, in rock and roll Depends centers. on the tumor, right? Yeah. Um, you know, depressingly, pancreatic cancer, those trials don't take very long. Mm -hmm. um, breast cancer, they take a lot longer, particularly if you're working in an mm -hmm. earlier stage. And that's obviously a driver of the cost, because you're looking after patients, you know, they come in for clinic visits every four to then eight weeks, sometimes for two, three, four years. That's why it's so expensive. And everything we do has to be documented very, very, very carefully. Um, and it's audited relentlessly because, of course, at the end of the day, the FDA, the Europeans, the Japanese regulators will come and look at the clinical data and say, can we believe what you're showing us? You know, they'll do an audit on us. So the, the documentation is extraordinary. Uh, and it's definitely a big part of the cost driver. So what percentage of patients in the United States are enrolled on clinical trials? And what percentage of patients in other countries are enrolled? The, just give us the up and the down. Harvey, do you know the number? I'd, I'd say it's about 13 to 15 percent. At least at our institution, 
we're lucky to be able to get 13 to 15 percent of patients at an academic phone. center. Yep. Nationally, two percent. Right. Yep. United States, it's two percent, three percent. In in European countries, uh, it'll be similar probably. Well, I think it's higher. Yep, it'll be similar. So, so there's a simple thing you could do in this era of simple care, universal care. What's that called? Obamacare. <laughs> easy, easy rollout, right? Tony, you have that one fixed. But um, why not? Why not link it to Medicare? Say you don't get Medicare benefits, you don't, you know, get an, on a clinical trial. Well, you guys have to make it easy for the community oncologists oh, no, they, with they the they patients on the trials. Okay. Fine. So Medicare. So we have a decision tree. We've got lung cancer. We're talking about lung cancer, and we have uh, a set of uh, a set of choices. And it's kind of cookbook for us now. There's a thing called the NCCN guidelines, and anybody can dial in to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and you can actually walk through these charts and figure out where uh, the decision points are. And we have first-line therapy, second-line therapy, third-line therapy even. Well, you could build an argument for saying no money for making it up, okay? But yes money for putting a patient on the trial. But then there have to be enough trials around. Bonnie. Well, you know, the biggest reason I think community hospitals don't do trials is what's in it for them. Private oncology practice, you know, there, there's no benefit to them to do it. Unfortunately, the benefit of the patient doing better doesn't appear to be a benefit. No, that's not true. Well, not the benefit to a private physician is business and competition. Exactly. The medical doc, the medical groups who are doing clinical trials, are perceived appropriately to be higher quality groups than those doctors who don't do clinical trials. Right. So it's worth the expense for private practice oncologists, people in threesies and foursies groups. That's the majority of oncologists in the country. Okay, to I be agree. part of clinical trial networks for business. So there, there is something in, the, in it for them. But the it's hard question. to get the patients on the trials. Right. But the original question. Because the trials stink. The, the original question, I think, I think we may be talking too much about us. I mean, and now that you've gotten a terrific review of how things progress, the original question was, how the hell do you know whether you're right. getting the right path with the right therapy. It's not, not us. I mean, yeah, we have NCCN guidelines and we can do this and we have industry, but how do you know? So, I don't know. I mean, I think that first of all, uh, it, it depends upon, you get it, you, you're told something. You're told that you have a problem, okay? So, what do you do? You're gonna ask, you're gonna ask around, but you're gonna be overwhelmed. So, the First, the, the, the quality care sort of things that I think the patients ought to know is, number one, there are clearing houses where you can get, where you can get help. I mean, a I mean, so you can, you can call and find out, you know, what should I do and what, sh what, what, it, what is the standard? That's the easy way. But, but for you, I mean, we've talked about certain issues here. You've got to be at a place where you're not an isolated entity where somebody's gonna discuss your case with other people so that multiple opinions are going to be able to be rendered and a consensus about what is best for you. And that should be at a place that is either involved with a place uh, through a network that knows what these trials are and the availability of those trials and whether those trials are done at that place and also the requirements for those trials, including not the least of which is whether you're gonna to have to have genomic testing. So I, I think that, that a lot of the burden comes on you at the very beginning, but the quality indicators are, did they mention that they're gonna have a multidisciplinary lung conference, that they're gonna discuss this? Uh, did you hear about this place from a clearinghouse that's reputable like the Adario? I mean, and are they recommending things for you that, you know, you're all very smart too, you look on the internet, 
that seem to be in line with what you think is on the internet. And if you're not satisfied that with that, then you have to come back to the clearinghouse and say, this is what I found out. What else can you tell me? But a lot of, it, it comes on you, but it's just like, I mean, it, it, it's sort of like you're not, you're, you're trying to find the best therapy. You may not need the high price spread yet. You may do well with a standard therapy, but you have to know where you're gonna get a quality answer. And people that say, no, you don't need a second opinion, by the way, that's not a quality answer, okay? So that's the, fir that's the first lie. I mean, you need another doctor. Right. That's what you need. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, the first thing is, you're, you should say, oh, we're gonna get another opinion, and they should be actively telling you where that other opinion should be. So there's and a reason I'm chairing this. Lake Tahoe, Truckee, that's for people who don't know where that is. It's really pretty remote. It's a small little place. It's real cold. It's in a ski area in a summertime place. But it's, it's very remote and very small with a, with a population of 15,000 people, with a catchment area of people out in the mountains of about 50,000 people. And we had no oncologists until my wife and I moved to town after we were at Cedars-Sinai in Los Angeles. And after a while, we built a program that was based on using technology to communicate and partner up with an academic center. In our case, it was the UC Davis Cancer Center. And there is a UC Davis Cancer Care Network of four other institutions in, in addition to us. Now, this is the simple thing that gives us the capacity to say we're doing the right, doing the right thing. Doctors eat lunch. Doctors eat lunch in what's usually a doctor's dining room. And what they would do in those doctor's dining rooms is pretty much kind of like talk to other doctors and it's about getting consults and talking with people and sharing information. But also, doctors in academic centers have tumor boards every single day of the week. The lung cancer tumor board at their institution is, at their institutions are weekly at USC, at UCSF, at NYU, and at UC Davis. Every Wednesday is lung cancer. Every Monday is gastrointestinal cancer. Every Tuesday is, G is urology. And every Thursday is breast cancer. Those four diseases make up 80% of cancer, just those four diseases. So if you build a program and a culture based around getting that 80% down, after a couple of years, you're going to have the infrastructure put together to take care of almost anything. So we built a virtual tumor board where our doctor's dining room is in a conference room. And at the end of the conference room, there's a TV camera. On the left side, there's a flat screen monitor with the Hollywood squares with Davis and Truckee and Marysville and, and uh, uh, Merced up there. And on the right side of the TV camera is a uh, internet-enabled uh, platform where we're looking at each other's CAT scans, MRIs, pathology slides, and PowerPoint presentations. And we are talking about cases concurrently every single day, every single day. With this technology, we've been able to then open up to even more remote places from Truckee, real little places, where the patients could be followed up because we're now comfortable using the technology. This model for rural oncology addresses 20% of the patients in the United States. And it takes nothing more than just recognizing there's something smarter you could do at lunch. You can participate on a tumor board. So these tumor boards now at all these academic centers are starting to open up on a similar model with a network. I know that UCSF has a relationship with a group in Santa Rosa, I believe, and in Reno, Nevada that there are ways to ask your physician, what's your academic connection? And not just what's your academic connection, how does it work? Tell me that it's real, not make-believe. It also allows for enrolling patients on, on clinical trials, which is still difficult, but moving, but moving forward. Well, to Bonnie. Your point, 
Larry, and to David's point, it's using Silicon Valley, and it's, it's working smarter. Right. It's it's working smarter. You know, you don't have to drive down to Davis to participate in the tumor board. You can do it virtually with technology. And that's how we're going to get the community hospitals on board. And Harvey's right about any doctor, any patient who's thinks they're going to hurt your doctor's feelings, because patients love their doctors. <laughs> they don't like doctors, but they love their doctors, OK? <laughs> if your doctor's feelings are going to be hurt, you've got the wrong doctor. That's the easiest, easiest uh, litmus test right there. Uh, they should be pushing you for second opinions with thought leaders. And a doctor who's been seasoned knows who the real thought leaders are. At the academic institutions, they all can do everything. The, the UCSF, there's nothing they can't do. There may be a couple things that Stanford might be able to do a little bit better, but you'll never get the guys at UCSF to say that, and you never get the guys at Stanford to say it either. Okay? <laughs> but people in the street, your private oncologists out there in the world actually do have these relationships with, their, with the academic centers in their own neighborhoods, and that's what you want to um, uh, encourage. Enough of the pitch. Go ahead. I wanted to... Uh, I, th I think we've got uh, like a half hour. I figured it's time for some questions. So have at it, guys. Oh. No drinking until the meeting is over, <laughs> Elizabeth. <Yes. laughs> One of the many things that goes with chemotherapy. Um, I have a question for you. Oh, okay. I have a question, and this goes um, more toward what's going to be happening in the next few years, hopefully, as far as ultimately is changing the paradigm in treatment. Um, I am very fortunate in that I am at, at uh, an academic center, and um, I was um, I undertook a molecular and genetic testing, and that was several years ago when the panel was only seven. Um, tests at that time, when fortunately it's expanded by quite a lot. The question for you is this. Um, a friend of mine was recently diagnosed with lung cancer, and she's currently at Sloan Kettering, and she went from a more community hospital up to Sloan after <laughs> a little bit of uh, cajoling. But um, I learned something that I thought was a little bit um, troubling from a patient's perspective, and again, I'm speaking from the patient's perspective, not the physician's or the insurance perspective, which obviously is driven by dollars. What I'm after are results in getting my damn cancer either chronically managed or ideally cured. Um, they, in, in her particular circumstance, and this is what I understand, is that um, molecular and genetic testing, if it's being done, it, at Sloan Kettering, they're doing a, a, a panel there, but at other um, organizations, they may only do it on an ad hoc basis, maybe do the EGFR and maybe do this one and that one, and they send the tumor tissue out you know, to one lab at a time instead of doing a panel. Why is it that with breast cancer and prostate cancer, when somebody is diagnosed, they do these tests right off, right off the bat? Why aren't they doing that for such a complex disease as lung cancer. Why aren't they doing these tests and basing at least partially their treatment on that? Because right now, even if they do do treatment and they've done these panels, from what I understand, the, the, the approach is still the same. And maybe once it metastasizes, maybe they will do the panel of, of tests. But then, only then, once they've gone through the typical standard of care, you know, a couple times, okay, then, you know, let's take a look at the treatment. What's your perspective on this? Who wants to this? take that? I'm going to take a stab at that, because those are great points. And that's exactly why you and everyone watching and Bonnie, you know, you have enough on your plate, but you need to get up and rise, because if you don't demand that this government have accountability, nothing will ever get, nothing will ever change. So firstly, what you describe in breast cancer, even colon cancer to a certain extent now, is called reflex testing. If you have a breast cancer, the pathologist doesn't ask some stinking oncologist or surgeon, do you want to know ER or PR standing? 
Why? Because it's been shown that it's prognostic and predictive for directing therapy. Just like you should have EGFR testing and ALK testing on your tumor, especially if it's an advanced stage tumor. You should not have to ask for that, okay? And that's a problem, but it's, it is innately now reflex testing. The pathologist gets a DRG reimbursement fee, unlike these great tumor boards, which has been shown, we've all been talking about, is advances care, improves your care. There is no line item to pay the doctors, and you may not think the doctors should be get paid, but they're not getting paid anymore in this country. So there's no line item to reimburse them for the time and the expertise to have an opinion, period. Never been. Never, they should be an in, in incentive. Otherwise, it won't happen, right? So for breast cancer, these, uh, these uh, pathologists are immediately reimbursed, and the test is covered because the breast cancer lobby fights for it, okay? And the prostate cancer lobby, guess what? It's this far from the pocket. So who's going to scream? OK? <laughs> Take your time on that one. Who's going to scream? <laughs> OK? So Bonnie's a screamer, right? Yeah, yeah. 1.6 million people, okay. of which the vast majority are going to die because they're not going to scream. No one cares. Mm -hmm. But you should care. Also, because it's completely unfair. How does it happen? It goes through CMS, Center for Medicare Services, right? They delegate molecular diagnostics to one crappy service of the 15 regions in the country that are delegated, the J1 regions, okay, one region, Palmetto, which is a company that is owned by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. If you don't think this is dirty, trust me, it is. And one woman, one pathologist who wouldn't know a gene if it ran her over, decides, I swear to God, this is fact. It's not funny. And you paid your Medicare benefit. You paid for You were taxed while you were working. You're still working, right? No, you, I'm, well, whatever I'm saying is you but paid for Medicare I'm, benefits, well, right? Yeah. And it's a great thing. It's one of the great advances in this country. Yeah. And Obamacare, I think, eventually will be as well if they get their friggin' website fixed. But nonetheless, you paid for it, and you're being denied. That's absurd. We have the science. It's not like you could say, well, I don't care about your stinking gene. You have three. You have five. Well, there are, you know, three billion base pairs, of which there are, you know, 30 to 40,000 plus splice variants, 160,000 genes. Good luck on that. That's foundation medicine, but $1 billion in the public market. Not one CMS approved test yet, okay? But nonetheless, you need to demand, because we know this is the way the future is going, right? So you need to just get on the phone, and we need to get in touch, and I'm serious, with, you know, we have a molecular diagnostic. It could save tens of thousands of lives a year. It has not been reimbursed. It's held to a total double standard. Why? Because it's lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Because it's lung cancer. Yeah. So if you don't believe the exactly. stigma is there, if you don't believe that something can get done, then you wouldn't be here. But this is a small little crowd. So, you know... Get online and have an instant clickable thing to talk to your congressperson, your senator, and politicize it. Right. And that's right. why it doesn't happen, because it all boils down to the money. Right. And, and unfortunately, yeah. lack of accountability and ignorance. Well, what's, what's unfortunate about it is that, you know, in my particular case, if I had had the molecular genetic testing done before I had my first round of chemo, my regimen would have been completely different because my one of the most toxic chemos I was resistant to. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriend, who is just now having chemo and um, going to be having surgery in this, ad, I guess you call it adjuvant um, uh, approach, she was telling me that she, if she wanted to have the molecular and genetic testing, she would have to pay for it out of pocket. Right. I mean, and this is something that is a key factor in determining what treatment she should have. Well, and you know, to your point, Elizabeth, you know, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer are, you know, all in the high 80 percentiles. Early, early stage breast cancer is 98 percent curable. What can we do together? you, community, patients, to make our cancer, our lung cancer, in the 80, par 80 percentile curable rate. What can we do together? It can't be just the patients. We have to do it together. And, you know, a combination of technology, working smarter, getting the community hospitals involved, patients yelling and screaming, problem we have is we have so few res survivors. Well, there are more and more survivors. There's so more raise and more. your voices. Call your congressperson. There's, there's make more yourself more. heard. It, you have to. You really have to. But seriously, do you really want to make an, in, a difference? And you're already making a difference. And it, one is to, to drive awareness. The other thing is to derive uh, you know, action. And so you make it easy for everyone. 
make it easy, because no one has the time or the wherewithal, or they don't think their voice is important. Their voice is the only thing that matters. To find out, and this is easy technology, find out who are the representatives in your jurisdiction, who are your Congress people, who are your representatives, who are your senators, and say, you know, I'm sick and tired of it, and here are the facts. Here are the facts for survival of lung cancer, early stage, late stage. Here are the facts. EGFR testing is not reflex, number one. It's not even reimbursed half the time. Okay, and foundation medicine, which is a good thing, and, and knowing more about your tumor, even if we don't have actionable targets per se, is still fundamentally a good thing. It doesn't cost that much, but it's not reimbursed. It's not about to get reimbursed anytime soon. So you have to fight because you have to say, firstly, I'm fed up, you know, and it's not fair that lung cancer have this total stigma and double standard for the dominant cancer killer, and the survival has not changed. And stage one patients don't even do that well, okay? So they, of all patients, need to have this, and your disease needs to be, you know, heard. Not to mention tax to big tobacco who caused half the disease. You know, there are lots of ways around it. But if the people don't rise and realize that the system is incredibly arcane and twisted, and really you have one small little group with very little expertise, truthfully, and a small little cadre of people who review for them that decide whether CMS will reimburse for your test. And if you don't get your test reimbursed, I don't care what drug you have, I don't care what gene or diagnostic Harvey developed or methylated next therapeutic and diagnostic EDA finds, it doesn't matter because it's never going to make it to prime time. And that's the sad tragedy that we've been bucking up against. There is one technological element that's taken place, and that is that I've not met a patient in the last 20 years who didn't come in with a big internet printout, or maybe now it's on their laptop, but still, either the patient or some kid or cousin of the patient has done the internet work. I can imagine social media actually being useful. I can imagine we have peer navigators, patients who've been around the block helping new patients. I, can, I can't imagine a patient being that isolated not to reach out and find another patient who's already been there and done that. And, and I could, if they can't find somebody, it's sad. But with social media, and I can't, personally, I hate Facebook, but I could see a utility for it here, that a grassroots uh, rising, so to speak, could be very rapid. Right. Could be very rapid right. and very effective if it, ha if it has the right leadership, Bonnie. Oh, thank you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so the technology Which is what we're seeing right now. <laughs> right. Technology is dividing the tumor up, as we discussed, <laughs> right? So now, instead of being lung cancer, it's now being divided into these individual genotypes, EGFR, ALK, ROS, RET, et cetera. And the danger there, obviously, is that it's easy to be conquered when you're divided. And there's a sort of logic to the way the system has been evolving. And it doesn't work for us, but there is a logic to it. And the logic is that drugs get developed for particular mutations. And when the FDA approves the drug these days, they approve the diagnostic at the same time. So as a drug developer, you, you have to basically pay for a diagnostic to be developed. So are you going to pay for an entire genome of sequencing when all you care about is one gene? Or are you going to pay for the single gene to be tested very cheaply? The answer is obvious. So the company will develop a single test for that single mutation in that single gene. And that's what gets approved by the FDA. And that's what gets reimbursed. Mm -hmm. And that has happened for EGFR, and it's now happened for ALK. But that's it, those two. So those are the only two for which there is kind of FDA support. And that's why there is a tendency to just reimburse those. Now, we're at this interesting point where we're switching now to, to doing whole tumor sequencing, foundation obviously being part of the, uh, the vanguard of that movement, where we're unearthing tons more information. And we're finding these kind of very rare mutations. There's, you know, 1% of patients have, let's say, a RET mutation, which overall, it's easy to kind of ignore the 1%. If you're one of the 1%, of course, it's everything to you. So I think that's how we've ended up in this position. And it is unacceptable, it's untenable, and it's not in any patient's best interest. And so the coming together of those disparate groups, of those separate molecular uh, phenotypes, if you like to use the jargon, the molecular different uh, teams, coming together is the only way to kind of affect whole scale change and start to seek changes in the way in which we reimburse testing, the way in which we do testing. And the weirdness of it all is that 
In lung cancer, we typically get, you know, in advanced disease, very small biopsies. And you have to kind of choose, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to, am I going to send it off to foundation and get everything done? Or am I going to send it off for the one test that I'll get reimbursement for? It's a choice. It's A or B, right? Not both, because you haven't got enough material. And of course, logically, you want to do the, the big test that you get everything but it's not reimbursed, it's more expensive, et cetera. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the dilemma that we're living with right now, and you know, maybe we'll get time to talk about blood, but there's, you know, things are changing, technology is always improving, but bringing these small groups together and advocating collectively for why mass characterization of your tumor is the right thing to do. As It's like Sun Tzu, right, just to quote uh, Tony Mock again, right, you have to know your enemy. So, of course, the first step in that, your tumor is your enemy, you have to know it. So, how did, today, what's the best way? Sequence it. All right, it doesn't, it's not going to give everybody the answer. Some people, unfortunately, today, just with DNA sequencing, we don't turn up something really helpful. That's regrettable, and that's, frankly, the ammunition that opponents will use as to why they don't want to reimburse. They'll say, because it doesn't always help. Well, no, it doesn't always help, but it helps a lot. So, knowing your enemy is step one in advocating for your own care. I think. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. Yeah, some of what I've heard today is that you want my blood, I gave it last Thursday. You want some of my tissue, I gave it last January. And you'd like me to be part of a clinical trial, and full disclosure, I am. But those are, to me, pretty passive things. And I'm wondering what you see as the active role of the patient. Both, uh, you started to talk a little bit before as far as advocacy, but also as part of his or her care. And we hear that now with personalized medicine, the patient should be part of it. But I wonder, is that really happening at your locations? Do you see it? How do we enhance that as patients? What do you see? Harvey. Well, it's pretty darn easy for a patient to come to me that has failed my surgery and comes to me and then goes to see my clinician and we don't have a trial for them that'll fit their profile. So where do they go? They go elsewhere, So, which is great as long as there's a place for them. But maybe that someplace else has to be far away. Not everybody lives in New York. So patient advocacy that would be able to expand the amount of trials that are at a given place so they don't have to go a fur piece to go someplace would be very, very useful. I mean, also would consolidate the way patients are treated. So I don't know what, and that would also help a lot of centers become more skillful and learn how to do this sort of stuff. So I don't know what else I can tell you as a patient. I mean, it's what you want to do. I mean, we, it's, it's pretty, it's, I have a guilt complex asking patients to give me things to begin with. So a patient comes to me like you and says, what else can I do to try and make things go quicker? We can always say, go to the government. We can always say, write your congressman. I'm sorry, I'm not so sure that that groundswell will help at this point, but does it need to be done? Yeah, because of the very arguments that you're gonna use. But I personally seen it happen in other tumor types and other diseases. So, you know, Bonnie and other foundations are organizing you, but have you organized yourself? And that probably comes from this social media concept that how many patients actually communicate with each other and really get to the point where they say, I've had enough and I can't stand it anymore. So when was the last time you brought 10 patients into your thoracic group and just talked to them as patients, not about their specific treatment, but just as patients for one or two hours? We do that every Thursday through our social services. Every Thursday there is group meetings at our cancer center, so that the, and that's specifically for lung cancer. So we do do that. And patients, if they want to hear about other patients' tumors and what's going on, and want to talk to each other, that's done. Now, educational fora, forum, that's done too. At least twice a year. You know, November, and then during the spring. So, again, you ask me what the patient can do more. 
for themselves. You're not asking me what I'm doing for you because I just told you. So again, if patients are really that passionate about taking control, then maybe patient groups should sit down or maybe patient groups should learn from the AIDS epidemic and what did they actually do? And who did actually organize? Was it a Bonnie Adario, who was a former patient or was a former? Ryan White. Sorry? It was Ryan White. Right. Of course it was. But he was a figure. Right. He was a figure. Right. We don't, you know, the number of Ryan Whites that we're going to have just because it's a different type of disease and because it's not a kid is not going to be very many. Right. So a different strategy, if you think that it was just Ryan White, I don't think it was just Ryan White. I mean, I was at the NCI when the protesters came. I mean, and it was pretty powerful. So I think it's not just calling your congressman, but it's, it's, it's almost like non-aggressive, but social sort of Anger. contention. Insurrection. <laughs> We're not kidding. That's We're not why, kidding. That's why Here's, all the me, videos, me, I liked your video the best last right. night because, of course I didn't have to be in it. Secondly, because an army. The army. An army, right? The one thing governments do not like, you know, aka Armies. Fox News and, and, and the Farm Bill, keep people fat and not hungry and stupid and ignorant and then they don't riot in, on Washington. But they don't like armies. They do not like armies. But so specifically what they army. accomplished, what the HIV positive community accomplished was <clears throat> they got the, the time from a drug idea to the marketplace shortened dramatically. Maybe 90% it would take nine years, it got down to one year. It did it by saying, hey, we don't care. This disease is going to kill us. Give it to us even though it's not 100% perfect yet. And I'll take it even further. The people that got most impressed, that pushed for that sort of stuff, were the very people that you think that are hurting you, and that was the people at the NCI, the people at the NIH, because it was Tony Fauci and it was Sam Broders that heard the message and started going to Congress and taking that. But it was after there was organization on the patients themselves that went and marched and said, you know, what are you doing about us? I mean, there's a lot of lung cancers, a lot of lung cancer patients that are being treated that are alive. If you want to do that sort of thing, then I'm with you. That's, that's advocacy too. But having more educational fora, sending more letters to your local senator or representative, I don't see it. Getting angry. I mean, this, I don't want this to come out gender wrong, but there's a reason why Breast cancer is really involved, and prostate cancer isn't. Breast cancer has moved the ball a long way, and prostate cancer hasn't moved very much at all, because right. men don't talk and women do, and <laughs> very effectively. And, and there's a lesson there. There's a lesson there, and that's probably the, the, most, ac the most useful kind of stuff that all of us are, are trying to answer your question with of how patients can get involved. Yeah. But that was in the era before governmental paralysis, the stupid sequester, and you know, absurd Tea Party politics. Yeah. So, so I mean, good luck. Uh, real revolution. No, no, I'm serious. <laughs> but let's be real here. I mean, you want to make a difference. You know, you can continue to raise a few hundred thousand dollars here and there and believe that that's going to change. That's, that is fantastic. That's not going to change Jack, OK? You need to get people angry and build the army and take the army to Washington or whatever. You know, but then the government doesn't have the money. And it doesn't matter what great idea you have, you won't get funded. Because the ratio for funding and a re-established investigator, it's not 20, 15% like it used to be in the good old days. It's under 5, 3%. So what are you going to tell the next brilliant person that I, you know, we introduced you to last night? What's she going to do? What's he going to do? You know, yeah, it's a sec. Know but we're oncologists, yeah. David. We look at 10% full instead of 90% empty. Yeah. So we've got to be positive about this. We've got to be positive and engage the patients in a, in a positive way. Empower them. Right. Go ahead. Um, I don't so much have a question as I just want to respond to the talking about the political organizing. I'm a nine and a half year survivor. 
I lost three sisters to lung cancer. That's why I was detected early. And part of what I think you're talking about as to why I'll speak for myself and my own personal experience, why lung cancer patients don't speak up, there is so much stigma. I've decided in my life, BS. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and take it. I proudly proclaim when I go karaoke singing that I'm a lung cancer survivor and say I can still sing. And I really think that um, the use of social media is very important. Hearing what you said, Dr. Jablons, about the testing makes me furious. It makes me think of moveon.org and how many other organizations that I am hooked up with. And I've recently decided I want to become a lot more active in the lung cancer uh, community. I work with the Lung Cancer Alliance right now. And I want to be a lot more vocal. My occupation is a trainer, and I think I can somehow do a lot of public education because I know how to speak well, and hopefully I'm engaging. But I mean, I am just shaking about this because um, emotionally, I think it's my own experience as a breast, can breast and lung cancer survivor, but also the fact that I saw three sisters go through the terrible ag agony of um, this disease, and it's really got to stop. And what Bonnie was saying, the survivorship level has got to go up. And people have got to stop thinking, there's something wrong with me because I've been diagnosed with lung cancer and I have to stay in the closet. It's time to come out and have no shame about this disease. And that's all I have to say. Thank well, you. This is, this Thank is you. the end. This is the, I mean, the, I'm actually yeah. tired of hearing about the stigma. When you think of coming out of a closet and the stigma of how you got AIDS, and compare that to, to, yeah. to having smoked and had, had lung cancer, it, it's night and day. So get over the stigma and just be angry, you know? Yeah. It's but about so, the injustice. It's not about the it's, stigma. Well, I mean, if the we, injustice yeah. that the government isn't reimbursing for lung cancer what they're reimbursing for breast cancer. If we think about how many people die, I, I, I read this analogy somewhere, it's um, over 150,000 Americans per year, and if you divide that per day, it's a full Boeing 747 crashing every single day of the year. Now think about it, if one of those planes crashed today, how much money would we spend to find out why that plane went down and make it never happen again? Well, this is happening every single day, every single day. And we add up, uh, the, the government does have less money, but we add up how many people die and how much money we spend relatively on lung cancer, and it's pathetic. It's getting better, but it's still pathetic. Uh, so let's, you know, the Department of Defense is spending money studying neurofibromatosis. I mean, what does that have to do with anything? What is it? It's, it, it you know, it's a rare disease. <laughs> We have uh, soldiers who got cigarettes from the army and who smoked and who went into battle zones and were exposed to all sorts of things, and yet they're spending a tiny fraction on, on lung cancer research. So you know, whatever money there is, it needs to be spent appropriately, but it's only gonna happen if you raise your voice. But the problem is, you know, we too low, something wrong. One plane goes down, it's on every national news, okay? Lung cancer is just another day. Okay, and then there'll be lung cancer fatigue and stuff. So, I mean, it's good to hear you angry, but so empower people, you know, figure out a way to make it visible. It is not really visible. And, and 150,000 is the most number of people who die. It's not the most prevalent cancers, but it's still a lot of people. You know, so if you got 10%, that's 15,000 people. You got 30%, you know, whatever, it's 45,000. It's a lot of people who could be pounding and, and marching. It's a small army, it's a regiment before you know it. But I think the first 10 years has been great, okay? Advocacy is great, you know? Now it's time for action. But David, there's something that we have to own up to. Yeah. We don't have enough trials, we make it too hard to get patients on trials, and it takes too long, and the cost is not an excuse. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way to do it smarter and cheaper and faster. And that's actually in our world, not theirs. And no, I, we need I, to I, own up to the fact that we don't do it efficiently. Sure. 
I'd be the first to to support, agree with that. But they're parallel issues. Right. You know. Go ahead. This isn't a question. This is more of a of a comment, and it's a comment to address to everybody in this room. It seems to me that if today we had uh, Jackie Spear sitting with us, and Joe Simidian, and a number of other people, and Joe Hill, and all those folks sitting here, that would be fabulous. So I guess my comment is, we've got two more of these sessions coming. We've got to get on the phone, or we've got to get a volunteer to get on the phone. And even if they can't get here, one of the aides from their office sure can. And you've got to believe that somebody who comes in from Jackie Spears' office or Joe Samidian or whoever it is, they're going to know somebody who has had lung cancer. It's going to be their mother. It's going to be their brother. It's going to be their sister. It's going to be their kid. So I would put out a plea to everybody in this room to call your... Um, your local representative, and let's get somebody here, let's get folks here in December and in January. So let's start here. Yeah, yeah, yeah good idea, Evie. I can't take credit for it. My friend Leslie. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a, that, that's a great idea, absolutely. Yeah, and that's easily done, easily done. It's gotta start somewhere, and grassroots is where it starts. Go ahead. Great, thanks. So it's very encouraging to hear the doctors say that something needs to change. I am a cancer coach, but I, today I'm calling myself a well-being coach um, because I think there needs to be a more integrative model to this. And for you to say, we need new technology to help, we need to find better methods for our patients, I think and now is the opportunity where everyone can come together and really collaborate, both from the patient's perspective, the family's perspective, the doctor's perspective, the cancer coach's perspective, and say, all right, we're going to look at this together. It's no longer you have the medical treatment and then everybody else figure out what you're going to do after you leave the doctor's offices, because that just doesn't work. Um, my mom is a, a lung cancer survivor. And to see the treatment that she got back in Alabama versus the treatment that the patients get that I work with in the integrative model, it's just this huge disparity. And so I love that this is really the beginning of the conversation about how we can come together and change the lives for the cancer patients and their families. So thank you. I think that's perfect. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank David and Ita and Andrew and Harvey and most of all, Bonnie. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and not most of all, Bonnie. Most of all, you. Exactly. Without our patients and without you trusting us and without our commitment to earn your trust every single day, we wouldn't have, be having this conversation. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.